My name is Richard Ball, I'm an artist uh, and also run some studios in Sheffield, uh, Block Studios, and we, we, we started in 1996. Well, when I first arrived, we were over the road next to the niche and um, we were above a sandwich shop, <laughs> bacon and bacon butter shop, basically. Um, buffers, it were called buffers, obviously, for the spoon, spoon polishers. But, um, we, yeah, so we, so we used to um, come downstairs and there was always a big queue of guys in blue overalls with sort of black hands from working and the working with cutlery, polishing and things like that. And they used to queue around the corner. I mean, the whole area was just like a wash with guys in blue overalls and fork trucks and, you know, and yeah. I mean, just down the road, just down the road, which is now a sort of kind of smart um, marketing company. Um, they used to have a four jammer in there and it just used to go all 24 hours a day. Boom, boom, boom. So my name's Angela Green and I'm a partner in the business and it's AK Orman's son. Um, it's been here many years, like 1962 or something, they moved into this building, but I've actually been here about 18 years. Nothing's really changed that much in, in the actual building itself where we are, but around the area has changed immeasurably. I mean, you know, we had that, another a cardboard factory, cardboard box factory at the side of it. Obviously, Pinders is still across the road, but I had a nightclub on the opposite corner. Um, so, yeah, so everything's like gone up, you know, really high around us and everything. And obviously, like the student population's increased immensely in Sheffield over that period of time, a gradual build up. But um, yeah, mainly it's gone from being an industrial area to student living. My name is Darren Mountain, um, here in the Lord Nelson pub on 166 of Rundle Street. I'm the publican uh, and I've been here nearly 25 years. Originally when I first came in here it was all industries, all workshops uh, and now most of that now is not here anymore. Uh, the area now is going to have a, have a massive dramatic change uh, in the next really five years. There'll be a lot of housing. Uh, so yeah, from the pub from 25 years ago uh, is complete change to what it is now. I'm David Pinder, uh, Managing Director, uh, been here 53 years. Our Sheffield was a very different place 53 years ago. The, we could park our car outside the front door and it was the only car there. The street was cobbled uh, and there was still an extra floor to be put on to the factory. Uh, the factory in those days was mainly making cutlery and uh, silverware, very little pewterware at that time. Uh, opposite us, uh, we didn't have a neighbour because that had been bombed and was a bomb site. Uh, to one side of us was a cutlery case manufacturers, uh, which was burnt to the ground and is now student flats. Uh, across the corner was Roper and Reeks, which was an engineering firm and uh, that was also burnt to the ground and is now student flats. And the only surviving neighbours we have are in one direction, um, a departmental store, workshop and stores, and a tenant factory on the other side, uh, also making silverware and items of that nature. Fridays originally, 12 o'clock, uh, we used to have orders already pre-ordered. Uh, probably had about 20 or 30 pints on the bar waiting for people to come in on 12 o'clock because they only got half an hour dinner break. Uh, and then obviously we did food as well in them days. Uh, and that's obviously when all the factories were here. Uh, and obviously it was very hectic for that half an hour. Uh, but it, that gradually changed after about the first three or four years when I got into the pub. Uh, and then inside after 10 years there was virtually none of that kind of trade left. We actually make um, a steel reinforcing ring um, that goes in the middle of uh, a grinding wheel to hold a grinding wheel together. So it's like a safety feature, if you like. So that the, the big glass buildings that are built now, like our main customers are like St. Gobain and people like that. So the people that have these enormous grinding wheels, we make the big steel ring that goes in the middle. So if there is any breakage, that holds it together, you know, so there's not no fatalities or whatever. It, it's a security feature. It started off originally, it was a guy just in his garage that did these things, got the patent for them, 
um, and then he actually got bigger and bigger as he got more customers. And we supply to Poland, we supply to Germany, we supply to Sweden, we even supply to China. You know, and, and it's just because of the quality of the steel that is the, you know, the English steel that is the good quality, which is why they can't make them in, in some of these other countries, because by the time they've shipped them, what they're paying for them, it's not worth it. Plus, everyone is done manually. So we get, we get lengths of steel, they go through a rolling machine, we make the circle, um, we bend it in, then it's, it's welded together, it's ground, it's flattened, and everyone has to be checked in the same size, and, um, and then we, we send them out in boxes, whether they be 200 or whether they be 2,000 at a time. Um, but yeah, that's basically what we do, it's a, a manufacturing of a, a, a steel reinforcing ring. It's, uh, we're a bit of a niche market. <laughs> uh, we're unusual in as much as we are silversmiths, cutlers and pewterers. And most of our production today is making pewterware, that's tankards and flasks. Cutlery and silverware are in decline. We're also exporters of about 50% of the pewter we make. Huge change in the last 10 years in as much as cutlery has uh, diminished tremendously. Uh, silver plated hollowware has, dimens has uh, 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 reduced its production considerably uh, and we've made more pewter wear until just recently when with the price of tin uh, going up by 300% also uh, we're not making as much as that now and so we are now importing cheaper merchandise from China. Uh, we tend to over the years of imported and sold, exported and sold and then back to importing and selling, uh, manufacturing throughout. Originally when they started building the big buildings we thought we're going to be next, we're on the corner, they're going to want us. So we did, we did go and look round at different places but we've decided just to stick it out and see what's what. I mean, who knows what, what the future is, you know, I'm like we're, fifth, we're like 53. So if it lasts another 10 years then we're good and if it doesn't, you know, we'll just play it by ear basically. It, as it creeps in around, there's a sort of sense of a kind of m ever receding island. Receding is that the right word? You know, the kind of the island that I'm on is getting smaller and smaller, and I can feel the the developers lap lapping up around me now, like you know. Well, the university is slowly spreading our way, and uh, we're almost one of the few. Uh, remnants of the manufacturing trade. At one time Arundel Street was nothing but uh, silversmiths and cutlers its whole length. Uh, now there's very few of any of this trade left at all. It's mainly Sheffield Hallam University. They run a decline for many years uh, and now you see a lot of little cafe shops and uh, people opening little businesses which I never thought would have happened probably five years ago. Um, so again, I know some people don't like to see change, but the area does dramatically need it. Uh, and I think maybe in the next five years, hopefully, with the investment that it is done in the right way, that this could be the next vibrant area in Sheffield. If you imagine like 10 years ahead, what would you kind of want the future of this area to become? Uh, I think, if I were really honest, I want it exactly the same as it is now.
I'm Laura Alston and I have, I've been the researcher, um, the historical researcher for this project um, and I've been looking at all the different layers of history that there are around this area um, from probably about 400 years they've gone back. <laughs> Does it reveal anything about like the character of this area or the, the, the spirit of the people who live there? Absolutely. I think there's a real um, spirit of um, entrepreneurial, um, I suppose, uh, desire almost. People came here, they flocked to this area because there was potential for them. This was a whole blank space um, that they could try and, you know, create something and, and um, realise their potential. I think for wealthy people they realise they could make a lot of profit from the area um, but I think what really kind of comes through is just the kind of huge variety. A lot of what's made this area so special is just people taking a chance and taking a punt on things because the space has been available. If someone wants to make music, they could just rent a cheap space. Um, and it's, it's just been like a space for people of all different levels to kind of go for it. Um, I was just wondering if, if, if that's reflected through history. I think that's exactly what happens. I mean, that is exactly what happened when it became um, the space that we kind of know today um, from this rural space it turned into somewhere where people could um, suddenly kind of come in and do what they wanted and they were they were looking for every available space you've got people building plots in tiny little alleyways um, because they can't you know because it's it's free land you've got people kind of taking up this space and um, putting their own stamp on it and their potential and um, yeah kind of pioneering themselves into making this the industrial, an industrial hub of Sheffield and, and a creative hub as well and I think that really rings true from throughout you know all of all of the archival research. One of the things that's come up so far is um, this idea of jeopardy. People, people never feel too, too uh, comfortable here. Definitely, you've got a huge um, changeover of properties. All the time these properties are being passed from hand to hand. Um, they belonged um, to the Duke of Norfolk, um, so you know they, they could do whatever they wanted really if they decided that they were going to take back the tenement, they could. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got then people that then lease that from the Duke of Norfolk for quite a lot of money, and then you've got someone paying a mortgage on it and subletting it to, you know, maybe ten or twelve different people in a workshop, um, and so you've got this this huge kind of changeover all the time. People are um, changing what the work does, so the marble works could become a cutlery factory in the space of ten years um, to become tenements. Um, so yeah, there is this kind of very quick kind of nothing really stays. Everything is a, is built on layers of things. Um, when archaeological digs have happened, you've you've found just you know huge amounts of different works that have just kind of been built on top of each other um, over maybe over just 50 years. Um, definitely post Second World War, you get a big kind of influx of, of new building and building over and into the 60s and 70s people wanting new architecture and building you know bigger places and I suppose over the 19th century as well you've got smaller workshops becoming big works and people in fact instead kind of going to work in bigger factories around here rather than in their own little workshop um, so yeah, it is a, it, there is that sense of kind of urgency, of jeopardy, of it not really ever remaining one thing. There's no constant. It's continuously different. <laughs> My name is Mark and 
We are in my new gallery. I'm trying to start a new kind of contemporary art space to give representation to early career artists. Um, there aren't many spaces at the moment in Sheffield that are kind of doing that. A lot of the ones that were that catering for that early career side of the kind of art world, I guess, um, have grown a lot and so the representation has changed. So I kind of want to step in and kind of do something about that. My name's David McLeavy. I'm the director of Block Projects. So I organise the gallery programme and the general management of the of the gallery. I think it my aspirations for Block is that it provides it continues to provide um, really great support for artists who are in early early to mid career positions. Um, in the past, there's been waves of support, um, but nothing consistent around supporting these um, in, people in quite a precarious part of their career and that's not just necessarily support in terms of facilitating exhibitions but also financial support as well so being able to be a hub for that in the city and, and wider afield I think nationally um, as well and potentially internationally being one of the places that really supports and cares for emerging talent um, in the arts. Yeah, I mean, what I'm doing here will kind of rely on a community of a, of a type of community. So to be able to kind of hold that together or be part of that's quite important, I guess. And to be able to kind of add to other people's ideas and to kind of support that, I think that's it's like quite a nice exchange, isn't it? I think it's good to have an arts organisation because we're really flexible. We can be really flexible with our um, intentions, what we do our needs, our roles, whereas I guess lots of other organisations, whether it's kind of um, cafes or um, pubs, they're quite specific, whereas an arts organisation can be much more open and hopefully can play a role, and it kind of has done in the past, but play a role where it's a hub for people to come and engage with things that perhaps are slightly unexpected, um, or a place where people can come together um, to share ideas and especially around kind of ideas that might be affecting lots of different uh, additional occupants of the area that could be hosted at block in some way. Um, like a community, like a community space but around kind of critical thought. I've been wanting to set something up for like kind of early career stuff, early career artists for a long time, like since I was a student pretty much. And that was like five years ago, six years ago maybe. Um, so I've, I've been wanting to do that for some time and I've just never found the right space. Everything's always been like, the building's needed too much work for me to take on or it's been far too expensive or miles away from anything so people probably wouldn't go. It's been kind of quite hard to get that right so I've been to visit countless buildings. There's always been something that's got in the way but then my friend Ed who um, Run, runs Delicious Clam, which is the label that kind of, they were in the building that got bulldozed. Uh, just sent me a message saying that he'd seen this had come available and to be quick. So I was quick and I immediately went and got a viewing. And on the same day, kind of basically said, I want to take this building on.
Jess Rosewarn um, and I'm the owner manager of The Holt. Um, so yeah, I run all aspects of the business um, from kitchen, baking cakes, through to coffee, events, yeah, everything really. I'm Craig, uh, the company name is C in Colour and we fundamentally print uh, t-shirts, hooded tops, any kind of textile stuff like that. Uh, we've been in this unit about six years and before that we were at uh, Atticliffe and then we got this unit which is great. It's really interesting to be in this area. It's, um, it's quite an eclectic mix of different things going on. Well I think our customer base is it's reflected in kind of how the area is and the different types of people that there are here. Um, you know we have quite a lot of students um, and staff from the universities because obviously they're very nearby. Um, we have quite a lot of um, parents with young children that come in. We have uh, people who work nearby in offices or other businesses. Um, you know, we then have older, retired people who come in at sort of all different times of day. Um, and yeah, it, we've recently um, got more um, of, the, sort of the tradesmen that are working on the various sort of building sites nearby. I think to start with some, some of them a bit like, oh, what's this, that kind of space, you know, because although we are a cafe, it's not your sort of typical kind of cafe to look at. Um, so sometimes people are a bit like, oh, what's that? But yes, yeah, so it was, they've become more comfortable with it. We've yeah, now got quite a lot of like the tradesmen coming in here for various things. So yeah, a massive mix of people, which is really nice. And I think what it's part of what gives it a nice kind of community feel that all parts of communities are represented here. Six years ago it was pretty much derelict on the end of Sydney Street um, and opposite where J-Wing is now that was a, a semi-derelict building as well uh, but on the other side it was a great thriving art scene graffiti was changing every single week and to be part of that was was pretty good um, we got to know everybody around here and it was a nice little community of people? Um, I think there's kind of different aspects to what using a space like this does um, for the community. I, I think part of it for us was kind of showing people that you can utilise spaces which might be regarded as sort of, you know, just too old and abandoned and, you know, the only future for them is to be knocked down and turned into something else. Um, but also because it's you know it's a really interesting space. It's um, you know it's the kind of space that is often closed to people, um, be that because there's actually industrial work going on there or because it's just closed off and you know it's sitting empty. Um, so I think people always really like coming in here and sort of having access to sort of the industrial heritage of this city, which you know still exists today, just in different forms. Hello. I think the low life is, is to seeing it change from what it was. I think that's the lowest point of it for us. Um, realistically, it was inevitable. I mean, it's prime real estate, so <laughs> it's going to happen. The money's going to come. But I, I genuinely did think it was like a, a Sheffield version of Five Points in New York, where you knew it was primary real estate, but the creatives got involved and it became an almost an iconic little area by itself, um, but it, it's going to come to an end just because the money, money side of it. Uh, and I think when the university is involved and Sheffield City Council, it is purely about money and the independents are suffering and the, the creatives, it was all artists and independent companies here. Nobody, nobody was here apart from those kind of people when we first moved in, uh, which is a pity, pity. And it's those guys that are going to suffer. You know, we don't know what will be happening this time next year or the year after that, which is a bit scary, but it's yeah, also really exciting because there's lots of possibilities. I'm 
David Wood, I'm Chief Creative Director of J-Wing. Um, I have sort of an overall responsibility for the creative outputs um, from ac across all of J-Wing's uh, businesses. Um, and so that's about four or five studios uh, across the UK and one in Sydney in Australia. We moved in in April this year, so not that long really. The lease on our previous building was, was coming to an end. I'd, uh, I'd been in working for J-Wing for three or four years uh, at the time and just in discussions with the board we decided that our old location wasn't really a sort of place where we wanted to be um, so I was kind of tasked with the job of finding somewhere else for us to to move to um, and we had a certain criteria of what we wanted to do with that so it was literally a case of getting out there and seeing what what buildings were available, uh, also speaking to an agent. Um, and ultimately we found this place. I was quite surprised to find it, to be, to be honest, to find a building of this nature so close to the city centre, so close to a major transport hub because we've got offices all over the UK, so access to trains is really important for us. It just felt like an area with tremendous opportunity that, that was about you know, things was about to happen in it. We've also got a lot of young people who work for us and there is quite a good social scene within work and beyond work. So being close to everything that there is happening around here at the moment was uh, was really important for us as well. A bit of a random one, but um, I've started, uh, I don't know if you know, but, um, I've started uh, volunteering for a charity called Contact the Elbow. Um, I'm going to be quick. Quite emotional when I talk about <laughs> okay. it. So, um, yeah, so the, the charity is basically um, they look after 75 year olds who haven't got any friends or family um, that are basically lonely. So, uh, what we do each month is we, uh, we collect one person, we take them to a tea party, and it absolutely makes the week, month, year. They absolutely love it. Um, so, my call out is basically to find out if anybody will be interested in hosting a tea party. Um, there once a month on a Sunday, we're looking for people that have got um, enough space, well, it doesn't have a massive room, but basically space to hold up to 12 people. Um, the, yeah, you just really need downstairs toilet to use the access. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much it. Well, we talk about wanting to be a really good neighbour. Uh, it's important to us, you know, so when we were working with the council to help us um, uh, move into this space and make that transition easier for us. You know, the reality is we're bringing a, a hundred sort of highly skilled, quite well paid jobs into the area. Um, we used to have a restaurant in our old office because we were a bit isolated from anything. Um, we didn't bring that here um, because we want people to go out at lunchtime. I think it's important to get away anyway from work, go and have a walk spend some money in the local places. In fact, we've even developed a Friends of uh, Albert programme where um, we've sp spoken to local independents about um, uh, discounts and offers for, for our staff because there's a hundred of us moving here and you know there's potential for, for them to come and spend their money in, in their places, really. So, um, so yeah, that was important for us. Being near the universities, we're developing really good relationships with the universities because we want to develop our own more formalised graduate programmes. So it's important that we, we do that. Hopefully we've set the tone of what's possible for this area. We've developed a building, I think, sympathetically um, to, to what it was. Um, um, and hopefully made it even more, uh, you know, made it better. Um, and I know speaking to the various developers around here that they've, we've sort of raised the bar of what the expectation of what they want to do around here um, and can see a real value in doing things well rather than just flattening things and building fairly anonymous, uh, you know, apartment blocks and things like that. I mean, as part of our Good Neighbour programme, we've done a river clean. Um, as part of the Port of Brook, we've got quite a keen angler here who's um, fishes part of the River Don and, um, because the river runs you know, at the back of the building and it's nice for us to look at that. So, yeah, we're, 
we're really keen to see the area thrive but in a really positive way and a sort of interesting way as well that's I think that's what makes communities and it needs to be a, a community um, function I made crisp uh, part of Delicious Clam, which was based on uh, the corner of Sylvester Street and Rundle Street up until about a year ago. We started in about 2014 or 15, just when we got the unit basically, and then from there sort of gave it a name and did a label and started recording bands and stuff. To me, I mean like when, when I first came to Sheffield, uh, it wasn't until I sort of got involved with the music scene and stuff like that and I just started to discover these like little hidden gems um, around the place and like to me like that was the real value in the city. It just created like a really nice and like really interesting sort of part of the city that um, I'd, I'd never like experienced before anywhere else before I moved to Sheffield. My name's Paul, a lot of people know me as Tufty Light in Sheffield. What was it like when you first started your practice room in 2006 in that area? Well, the area, it was a bit run down. There was, there weren't people living around there so much. Um, there were places like Niche, Gate Crasher, nightclubs. So it was sort of a place where people didn't really go, unless they, unless they worked down there or unless it, they were there late at night on a night out. It wasn't really part of Sheffield people people frequented. The, the, the beauty of having the space to be able to expand and create such you know it, such cultural things and not have to pay a fortune for it. People can do an odd job. They could perhaps work in a pub a few nights a week but then pretty much dedicate a full-time, you know, workload into what, what their dream is. Yeah, I don't know if I'd still necessarily be in Sheffield if it wasn't for those kind of things going on. And I think that the same is probably true for a lot of people. I mean, if there wasn't a place to sort of do stuff like that, um, I, you know, I don't know what value necessarily there, there would be in Sheffield if it wasn't for like sort of arts and music sort of community. And, um, you know, it gives like, just, yeah, it gives a bit like having a having a space like to record or like put on shows sort of gives a bit of a bit of a purpose, I guess. And another thing that's come up uh, throughout the project is that there's been a lot of people who've added value um, to this area um, and made it better, but then they'll be squeezed out and they won't get to share in the value of the community that they've built. We've got about, you know, 300 years of people putting their all into this space, perhaps not really getting out of it what they, you know, thought they would or, or what, you know, what they dreamed about when they, when they, you know, started a workshop. You've got a lot of people whose, you know, conditions of life were just really harsh and I think they make up the variety, you know, they make up what the experience and the character of this place is, but at a kind of real cost to themselves. 
Um, and, so, and, you know, we have to sort of count that historical, co we have to be aware of it, I think, and it still continues. I think it's that the history is important because you want people to, to think about how, how they affect the place today and how they can affect change in it or have a say in it. Um, but there is kind of limits on what that say is and how it will change over time and where it goes in the future. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely the, the kind of story all the way through. <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, Bri, part of the collective who uh, run the Lugo DIY punk space in Sheffield. So in Sheffield, it's like over the past 10 years, this is, this is the point where it's all come to. They're like collectives that have been putting on gigs and arranging practice rooms and practice spaces for bands in Sheffield. Um, we've eventually, eventually found a place where we can all be under one roof, we can all have practice spaces and we can do gigs when we please on our own terms. So having like a centre point for, uh, for the punks in Sheffield is important because people feel like they've got somewhere to go, but somewhere they feel comfortable playing and practising. Uh, which which means more bands start evolving, more people get involved, and the scene just flourishes. We've already had uh, threats of like eviction. Um, it's, it's been put back now, due to, maybe due to funding or something like that. But like the area is totally changing, there's new buildings. It's kind of working its way this way it feels. Like across the street as well. You can see everything's kind of changing. We've had like, we've had letters tell, uh, telling us what their like plans are for the street. It's going to be like, like food outlets, uh, flats, offices. Um, so eventually, like it's, it's inevitable, we're, we're going to be pushed away, um, which is a total, it's a total shame. But unfortunately, it's probably going to happen eventually.
I think a lot of people that come from Sheffield from other cities, you know, they, they probably think, oh, this is ripe for development, or, you know, or, oh, look at all these un underused spaces and stuff. But, but there's a beauty to it. And e even though some things do look sort of semi derelict or underused, there, there's, there's an absolute hive of activity going on behind these facades. At one time, this area was sort of full of guys in blue overalls running around. Now it's full of artists running around. We might not be wearing blue overalls, but we're here. We go to the pub, we walk around. We're, we're, we're a sort of, there's many people in this, but there's 60 artists plus in, 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 well, you know, in this building, not to mention all the infrastructure around the gallery and stuff. So we've got as many people here as what used to work here when it was you know, some folks. It's almost like a, a second home, I suppose, having come here for 53 years for all my working life. Seven, sometimes even seven days a week, but certainly always five days a week. I love it on a kind of late summer's afternoon when everyone else is gone and the sun's coming through the skylight and I you know, lock up at the end of the day and kind of look around and think, this is really cool. Like every, every, every night I've, I've spent down here since the time we opened, which was like December, uh, December 31st, 2013, so that's like three and a half years ago now or something. It's just been like like the best nights of my life. We're just, uh, we're just promote just having a good time and chaos, but like in a good way. 